so we want to welcome you here. First of all, we are a group of women who um, we're, we're, we're friends, we're colleagues, and we're just on a mission to inspire healthy living around the world. And so every Wednesday we bring a topic, different topics, different areas of interest that can help you to support your, your health journey. And so today we have a, I'm super, I've been super excited about this. Um, my friend and, and colleague, Dr. Nicole McCauley is here. And so I'm not going to really give you any information because we're going to reveal all of that within our conversation. So if you're here as a guest, we want to welcome you. And um, if the, per the person who invited you did this because they really care about you. So I hope that you can you know, demonstrate some gratitude for that. And then uh, I'm going to share something here, share a little video. Dr. Nicole. And then we'll get going. Imagine a five-year-old girl. She's so excited because she's on her way to Disney World. And this matters to her because things aren't so great at home. Mom and dad are fighting. Her parents decide to turn the car around because no more are they going to go to Disney. They're also no more going to be a family. They decided to get divorced and everything changed. There was nobody there for the kids. They didn't have enough food, and so they had to go to the food pantries. It was quite embarrassing for them. When she was at school, her behavior wasn't the best because she hadn't been eating, and her grades were suffering because she hadn't been eating. One day, this teacher saw her and said, I see your potential, you, you can do the work and she had compassion. And she said, you know, your past doesn't have to be your future. And as they kept talking, she kept sharing her lunch and they started learning about multiplication tables and they started talking about the life cycle of a plant. And so that little seed was planted in that little girl's mind. She had made a decision that no matter what, she was gonna be able to feed herself and other people and so she put herself through undergraduate school and graduate school and started a business at 25 and made that successful and pushed and pushed and pushed until she realized it's time to give back. I have more than enough. Let's go. Let's, let's get on this mission. And that little girl was me. I'm Dr. Nicole McCauley, and I'm the CEO and founder of the McCauley Foundation. The McCauley Foundation exists to serve the one billion people that are suffering from food insecurity around the world. The world is coming to a place where we're just running out of land. We're not going to have enough to grow our food for all the people that are on the earth. So we create agricultural ecosystems for nonprofit organizations, and we do that here domestically in America, as well as we are working with the global creative economy to serve the other countries around the world. We're growing vertically. We're not dealing with the erosion issues. We're not dealing with the, the drought issues, uh, ground pests. There's so many challenges that can come from trying to farm an area that's not set up for agriculture, you know, like the desert, for example. We can grow in a desert year round. It's just phenomenal what's possible when we're growing with aeroponic technology. We're at my pediatric and perinatal chiropractic practice, and this is my residential tower garden. We have lettuce down at the bottom, some salanova, it's this beautiful red, and then I have some Swiss chard here, and some romaine, and some head lettuce, basil, and microgreens up here. They're a great addition to your salad, and a wonderful snack. <laughs> So we have the basin with the water and the minerals, and there's a pump in there that will bring the water and minerals up through the center of the column, and then it'll rain that water on down. And so this is called aeroponics, and aeroponic technology exists because half of the time the plant roots are exposed to oxygen, and the other half of the time they're being exposed to this water and mineral blend. And that helps them grow three times faster. So we're producing 30% more produce in less time with 2% of the water and 10% of the space. It's a really, really efficient way to grow.
The biggest challenge that we face is that there are approximately 10,000 children worldwide that die every single day of starvation. 10,000 that needlessly die and we can't get the food to them fast enough. We are always looking to partner with individuals and organizations that are on the same path that we are. Individuals can gift a tower to family members, schools, or their preferred nonprofit organization. Employers can even sponsor towers for their employees at their place of work. When I see somebody who hasn't had the opportunity to have food, put it in their mouth. That's when I know we've reached our goal. Wow. Oh. <laughs> I had to watch that several times because it just got to me every time I watched it. And I found that I was having a difficult time not just crying my eyes out. <laughs> so I'm still may not be able to get through that one. Whoops. Whoops, whoops, whoops. It affects Sorry. every aspect uh, of the body. We'll edit that out. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, Nicole. So Ah, that story is just, it's just absolutely inspiring. Um, so tell me, just, just where are you at now in this, in, in your goal of feeding, I think you told me the other day, 10 billion people. There are 10 billion people who are food insecure around the world, and you have a goal of feeding them. So one billion, yep. One, one billion. billion, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. That's yeah. Okay. One billion. yeah. Yeah, it's... It's insane. It, and just to go back a little bit, one of the biggest challenges that happens is that there's so much shame around it. Uh, I, I can tell you from experience, you know, I, I didn't want anybody to see me. I didn't want anybody to know. Um, I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be picked on. And then there are a lot of people who are very proud and too proud to ask for help. Uh, so the, the amount of folks that are struggling and suffering, we may not even really know the true details on that. Uh, but what happened with me that is not in the video, and if anybody wants a copy of that video, I know I didn't stream super well, uh, I can certainly get it to you. That's not a problem. It's it's a really fun way for me to tell my story so I don't have to get emotional while I'm also trying to speak because <laughs> it makes me emotional to tell it. And I can um, make it available in the YouTube link too, if you don't mind that. Yeah. Uh, and so here I was, I was learning about how to grow this tower garden because I bought one for my office and you all saw that in the video and I all but killed it because I think that I know everything right <laughs> I'm so sorry no 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 um, and I thought well okay what if I what if I put this special water in here that's got you know this high pH certainly that'll be good and and I'm only there every two weeks anyway long story short I just almost destroyed this thing and uh, my NMD my national marketing director uh, brought in a someone else who's on our team, who's a horticulturalist and who specializes in tower farms. And, and uh, she's a, what's called an ACR, authorized commercial representative. And so she said, would you mind if I bring Andrea in to just look at your tower? Cause it's really sad and <laughs> we, we need to make this look good. And I was like, sure, please. I don't have any clue what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, so she came in and Andrea looked at it and she's like, oh, just do this, that, and the other thing, and it'll be fine. And sure enough, she was right. It's so simple. I had way overcomplicated growing in a tower. It's the world's easiest way to grow anything. And yep, I just made it harder than it needed to be. So anyhow. As we often do. <laughs> Laura said, well, why don't you, why don't you come with me to watch Andrea speak? Uh, she's speaking next weekend at a Kansas City Regional. It'll be really fun. And okay, great. And so I go there and I've got my notebook. I still have this same notebook. It's actually in my briefcase right over there. And in the notebook, I had opened it up and I had written Andrea Kirkhoff and then the name of her presentation she was gonna give. And it was at that moment that it was like, the, and this doesn't happen to me. This, this was a very new thing for me. So it really caught me off guard, but it was like the whole room went quiet and I got to see this visual representation of all of those things that I talked about in the video. I got to see the good with that teacher, Mrs. Shoniker, Mrs. Jane Shoniker. Um, and I actually did get to thank her a couple of years ago in person, but I got to see that, but I got to see the hard stuff too. And I got to see where, I mean, I had, I stole food. I did. I stole food to live. Um, 
I ate moldy food. I I did things I'm not proud of. And I remember as I'm seeing these these things unfold in front of me, I've got this this visual overlapping over the top of it where God's there going, you know what, girl, hang on. I need you to have this experience. I need you to be strong because you're going to need it later. You got this. You got this. And so I got to see all of this. And at the end of Andrea's presentation <laughs> and this this like video film that was going on in my head, I've got tears on the paper. You can still see the tear stains. There's nothing else on there because I missed her entire presentation. And I'm like, Ugh. and I, I get this, I need you to feed my kids. And what I didn't tell you is I'd been fasting and praying about something a couple of weeks prior to that that had nothing to do with this. And so it, I'm like, but what about the question I asked you? <laughs> so anyway, here I am again, making life way more complicated than it needs to be. So moving on, um, yeah, I sat, I sat with that. And I'm like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? How's blah, 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 blah. And I, I rode back with Laura and I just laid everything on her. So it was a three and a half hour trip. And I'm like, and then this happened, and then this happened. And, then... and she's like, girl, we got we to gotta go ahead on this. We got to help some people. And so I said, I, I know. And, and Tower Gardens are how we're going to do it. We're going to start with our school. Uh, I knew a teacher and I said, I'm going to donate you a tower and we're going to get you growing. And she's like, that's awesome. What's a tower? <laughs> and uh, so I brought her over and I showed her how it worked. And, and I, um, I got her a tower for her classroom. We ended up giving three to that school. And so they were able to do uh, some fun projects from one class to another. And that's where it started. And then it turned into this Oh my gosh, we've just evolved and adapted this whole project going from creating a business called Planting Seeds to now we have the Macaulay Foundation because life has changed with COVID. Uh, and the way we do things is we're providing agricultural ecosystems for nonprofit organizations. And let's use schools as an example. So we apply for grants for the school and, and we come alongside and we show them, you know, how do you do a raised bed garden? How do you do a greenhouse for vertical growing in a tower garden? How do you make this sustainable? Uh, because it's, it's a great idea, but it's just an idea unless you have a way to make sure that it continues. So we want it economically sustainable as well as ecologically sustainable so we can impact the most people. Uh, and using that example of a school, we have a school that we're working with in Nixon, Missouri right now. It's called John Thomas School of Discovery. And their project or their plan is to grow half as much of the, pro excuse me, to grow the, all the produce that they need for their cafeteria needs, and then half as much more so that they can have a consistent donation to their local food pantry. So the kids are gonna be able to eat that produce in the cafeteria. They're also learning how to be producers, not just consumers and how to care about their community. And so they're able to make that donation. They're there every time the food pantry comes and they see that and they help harvest for that uh, because that part is what where they can work. It's also a GAP and certified, excuse me, GAP and GIP certified farm that we're working with there because anytime we're selling to an industrial source uh, or an institution, we have to make sure and have that. So it's good agriculture practices or good handling practices, GAP and GHP. Uh, and that's that's a really, really important thing to think about, too, as we're working through all of these processes, because that means we have to have somebody who's in charge who can do all of that. So we create jobs. We create a greenhouse manager position for that farm. Um, and then in larger farms, of course, there are more jobs. But uh, in this situation, we're creating one job for a greenhouse manager. And we create community partnerships, too. So there's a university that's local called Missouri State University, and they have a hydroponics department and at the university. But of course, aeroponics is a step up from hydroponics, and everybody wants to work with aeroponics. And so I'm doing my best to create as many internships as I can. <laughs> Uh, but but they're all chomping at the bit to get in here. And so we've created paid internships for them too through the process of using grants. So we've got our position created for a greenhouse manager that actually the funding comes from the school being able to repurpose what they would normally spend on their produce and spending that money on the greenhouse manager. 
And so that way it's, it's all self-contained in there. Plus we come alongside bringing those grants in to help build all the infrastructure necessary to make that happen. And so they start that process and they, they work into planting enough food for themselves and uh, having towers in the classroom. So we've got our kids eating it in school. They're going home with it on the weekends. They had a backpack program, but sometimes, you know, calories don't always equal nutrition. And I will tell you, uh, it's great to have those calories. It really is. But it's even better to have that nutrition to go along with it too. So being able to, to serve their kids in their community and then having that consistent donation is a really awesome thing that they're able to do in their, their little area. Uh, so that's one example of what we're doing. Another example is at a senior center in Republic, Missouri. And at this senior center, we have um, horticulture therapy and kind of some memory uh, remembrance horticulture therapy. And there are uh, some individuals who hang out at that senior center who have some challenges with physical therapy and they can squeeze that stress ball a million times or they can go out in the garden and they can do some pruning. And that's been such a wonderful option to have for those folks uh, and creating a way that they can bring their grandkids in and they can connect with each other and have wonderful conversation over that. Um, and it, it's funny how territorial the folks can get. <laughs> um, but also how it does create teamwork. It's, it's just an interesting dynamic to see. And then a, a different farm that we have. And by the way, that farm, of course, also supplies a food pantry. That's the rule. If you're going to work with me, you've got to make sure and feed people beyond yourself. Um, and then in a place called the Discovery Center, it's like a museum. It's an innovation museum for kids to learn about different things. And so there's a there's just really, really cool exhibits and you get to the third floor and the third floor, there's a tower farm. So we're growing a, a tower farm. It's 11 pots tall on the third floor in a building in a downtown. And we've got indoor lighting, but there are these kids that also go to school there. And of course, folks who come in to see the museum, they're growing this produce. And so they're learning about how a, a seed functions and becomes a plant. They're tasting it. They're creating recipes. They're doing all sorts of fun things with it. It's really, really neat. And uh, that's what we're doing here locally. And so we, we, we work domestically, but we also talked about being a global organization. And so we are working with the global creative economy to set up what are called centers of excellence. excellence is something that needs to impact 10,000 people, yeah, of course, in the dietary needs. And when they came to me and we were talking about this, they said, we only have 99 acres. Do you think it's possible that you could plant enough food to impact 10,000 people on 99 acres? And I said, well, I can impact 10,000 people in two and a half acres if you would like. We grow vertically. And it was just such a game changer. That was in Colombia, where we were talking with the folks in Colombia. And to be able to know that we can provide that much food to people that is nutritious, that's, that's making sure that they're getting all of the things that they need for themselves in a day. My goodness, what great things can we do? So we can educate, of course, on our local level. We can have this in our homes. We can have the, the benefit of being able to grow our own food and not having to worry about like the E. coli recalls that happen uh, or supply line issues. We've got our own ability to grow at home. We have the opportunity to grow in the communities, like I just talked about with the schools, as well as the senior centers and the museums, uh, prisons is another one, churches, there's lots of organizations who have the chance to do this. We have a community garden in this area too uh, that we're, we're connecting with, but then we have this global impact that we can make where we can actually truly feed the world. This is part of the solution for feeding the world. This is how it's going to happen and it's already happening in real time, which is unbelievable to me, you know, from from the concept of, I need you to feed my kids in 2017, here we are in 2023, and we are working in five countries to develop opportunities so far, and we have plans to work in all of the countries of the world. I, I have the front row seat to just the coolest thing, uh, the coolest show that I could have ever imagined, and this is not at all where I thought my life would be, 
but yet here we are. And it's so, so gratifying. I can't wait. And I actually bought my very own farm. <laughs> um, so my farm is going to be delivered. I have it uh, going to be in my backyard and that's going to be my showcase farm to be able to just donate everything we grow there to our local food pantry too. But that's what I have happening. <laughs> You need, I think maybe you need a few more things. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. In five years, in just five years, look at how, where that's come. So, so I have, I have some questions because I want to clarify for some things for some people that may sure. not, may not know. Um, so when you talked about 11 ports, 11 pots high, mm -hmm. how many plants is that? I'm so glad you asked Jake. <laughs> I know the answer, but I, I would like to hear from you, please. <laughs> That's 44 plants in as small as 30 inch diameter. So it's 10% of the space that you would need for traditional farming. And if I hadn't said this previously, it's 2% of the water. Now, depending on what you're growing, if you're going to grow fruiting crops, it uses a little bit more water, uh, but you, definitely less than 10% of the water of traditional growing too. And we're not making any more land and water is becoming scarce too. So it's so amazing to be able to grow that much. And there are some commercial farms that go 13 pots high. So that's an extra eight more on top of that. It's amazing what you can do. It's incredible. I remember when this, when Tower Gardens were uh, rolled out at a Juice Plus conference back in like 2012, 2013, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the presenter said that we would need, by 2050, we would need the land mass the size of Brazil to feed the world if we were growing traditionally. And this is why uh, vertical gardening was, is so vital to our survival. And um, I love, 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 love everything that you're doing here with all of this. Let me see here what my, what my other questions were here. Um, well, uh, one of the things, it wasn't really a question, but I, I picked up on when you were talking about um, working with the seniors mm -hmm. and how they bring their grandkids in. And then you we're talking about the kids in school. This is really multi-generational. It's for anybody, right? Absolutely. Yes. Anybody. And I've heard so often that when you plant kale, your kids will eat kale. If your kids yeah. plant the seed and nurture that seed, they're going to want to eat it. So if you can't get your kids to eat veggies, have them grow it because chances are they're going to want to eat it then because they've, they've had a part of that. Um, yeah, we've had whole salad parties at the schools where the entire school comes in and they all eat the salad that the fifth graders have grown and they're so proud of it. And they, you know, they're standing there and they're serving it. And it's, it's phenomenal to see how excited they are. Uh, I did a, I did a TV interview too. I can send you the link for that. And there was this little kid that was at that and he was sitting down and he's like, I grew that. I'm the father. <laughs> I was oh, like, how do you not laugh? laugh right? Like, oh, precious. <laughs> it was adorable. It's so super cute. But they really take ownership to that. And the beautiful part about having a tower garden, gosh, there's so many beautiful parts, but in a classroom, is you can grow year round, where in many parts of the country, you're only able to grow two and a half months out of the school year because it's just too cold, you know, or it's just too hot um, if you're looking at the Southwest uh, specifically. So that helps fuel that. But on the other hand, too, when you have students that have a difficult time engaging and being excited about school, and there's a lot of behavioral issues, and there's more and more and more. And the areas that need help the most are Title I schools. Boy, I mean, the teachers I talk to, they're like, I'm more of a referee than I am a teacher. I got into education to be able to make a difference. And all I'm doing all day is just making sure that the kids don't die and kill each other. And like that just must be so frustrating. Uh, but then when we bring a tower garden in, you should see that whole classroom change. They're excited. They want to see what's going on. They participate. The seeds are planted. And because it turns over so fast, it's 1.3 turns per month when you're dealing with lettuces and greens. It's engaging. It's like, oh, oh, okay. I did that. I grew that. Okay. And then they try it. They want to try it. Uh, not, their noses aren't in a, 
in a, in a device. They're yeah. interacting with other people and they're interacting with nature. And we know how important that is. And, yes. and I've got some towers in some schools too. And one of the things that the teachers say is that the, the, the sound of the water trickling is soothing mm-hmm. and it calms the kids that maybe aren't quite so calm. Yep. Very helpful for that. We did a, we did a taste test one time. I went and I bought some um, a, a head of bib lettuce that was hydroponically grown. I think it was hydroponic. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was ground grown. Anyway, um, and then I brought it in and we picked lettuces off of the tower garden and we let everybody taste it. And there were kids that said, I don't like lettuce, but I like this lettuce, the stuff that was grown on the tower. They just couldn't get over the difference in the flavor. And mm-hmm. then we had some teachers come by too, and they were blown away by the flavor. And I've had people say, I didn't know lettuce had a scent mm-hmm. other than like, if it's going bad, right? You don't want right. that. But when you're standing next to that tower garden and you can smell, you can smell the freshness of that lettuce there, it has a scent. It's wonderful. So imagine being in a greenhouse just full of it. So let me ask you this. Um, in your tower farms that, you, that you're a part of, what's the average number of towers that you're growing? That's a really great question. So the, the community farm that we did for the senior center has 12 towers. The, the farm for the museum has 10 because of the space purposes. The tower farm at John Thomas School of Discovery is 125. And then of course these center of excellence farms are in the thousands. Thousands. What do you find the best crops to grow when you're gonna feed a bunch of people? What what are you choosing to put on the towers? Yep, greens and lettuces and herbs. Very best as your, your easiest thing to grow. You're so successful with that. It's the highest turnover. Uh, you can grow so many other things too. You can grow anything in a tower that you would grow above ground that doesn't have a woody stem. But I always start with that because that's something everybody can do and everybody can be successful with that. If you want to get a little more um, exciting with things, you can try stuff like uh, tomatoes and cucumbers and beans and strawberries and and pumpkins and watermelons and, and all that fun stuff. And, and you definitely should. However, it takes a little bit longer to grow those things because they are fruiting and they take up a little bit more real estate on the tower. So if we're trying to get high density, high production, lettuces, greens, and herbs are where it's at. And that's what I'm doing on my indoor tower garden right now. When you say there's 1.3 times turns per month, what does that mean? That means that when you take a seedling and you put it in your tower in three weeks, it's ready to harvest as a whole head. Okay. And do you always harvest it? It's because I've been just like pulling the big leaves or what would you? You have the best questions. Oh my gosh. So there's, there's two really great ways to, to handle that. When we're working in large farm production, you harvest the whole head at once. When you're at your home, best way to do it is to harvest Uh, like select cut. So pull out what you're going to eat and let that plant keep growing. You can do that four or five times, depending on what you're growing there. Uh, But when we're in high production, it's pull the plant one at a time. It actually helps with keeping uh, some of the hygiene and some of the the cleanliness of of the farm. But again, at your home, I mean, it would be foolish to just pull the plant and be done. So definitely get your money's worth on that. So if you're really helping an organization, though, you would time it like how your time you're putting seedlings back in or what are you timing to put back in? Because you've just pulled the whole plant. Yes. Good question there, too. When we have a greenhouse manager, their function is to make sure everything is running smoothly and there is a timing. There is a routine. So when they come in, they're seeding. Plus, they're also watching for pest management. Plus, they're harvesting. They're looking at. So you never have a full farm of everything ready to harvest at the same time. You always have this succession planting, this this wave, if you will, so that every time you need to harvest, there's something to pull, but then there's something that goes right in its place. You have this constant wave going through there. Makes sense. Awesome. We have a question from... Facebook, but I'm not really clear on what the question is. So we'll, we'll we'll get some clarity on that and share with it. Okay, so let me take a look here at our time. Oh, we do have times up on our on our recording. So I just want to uh, we'll can do you have time to stay on for a little bit after to 
answer questions, Nicole? I've got five more minutes. Okay, great. Well, we want to thank everybody so much for joining us today. Um, I will have a recording of this later if you want to go back and watch. If you and if you um, if you notice that there was a link that you could follow in Nicole's um, video at the very beginning, um, if you want to get involved with that or donate or what have you, right? Um, they can, yes, they can go you, there Jay. for that, right? Um, and then um, next week, not next week, we're not going to have a Wellness Wednesday next week. We've all got something, uh, a big event going on. And so we'll be back on the 31st with uh, getting cheesy, um, with making a cheese that's not made with dairy. So we're pretty excited about that. So be sure to join us for that. And then if somebody invited you to watch this or to be a part of this, please get back with them. Um, if you're interested in growing your own uh, produce on a tower garden, or if you want to get involved with, you know, sharing it with your school, you don't necessarily have to um, buy a tower for a school if that's not, if, if that's not in your financial capabilities, there are grants that are available and um, we can, we can, um, you know, visit about that. So anyway, again, Nicole, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. It's powerful, very, very powerful. Thank and you. thank everybody for, thank you everybody for being here. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing on the live stream and then And I'm going to go ahead and keep recording the, the questions so that if anybody wants to ask any questions. So that Facebook question was how many towers did she have in the fifth grade class? Oh, well, my goodness. The one that was it asked around the time that we were talking about them feeding the whole school? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's at John Thomas School of Discovery, and they have 11 towers right now. We only harvested, I want to say, four. So essentially, when we're looking at an 11 pot tall tower, so 44 plants, and you're dealing with a child uh, or children population, you're looking at feeding approximately six people every single day from one tower. It's, that's how they figure that through. So um, that's... That's the way that I try to get my math around how do we plant as many towers as we need to. But there's always a little bit of wiggle room because sometimes you have a head of less lettuce that's this big, sometimes it's this big. So it's approximately six. Anyone else have questions, comments? Okay, I've got a question. Certainly, Sean, go ahead. So um, I've tried to get some towers into schools and the, the objection is always, well, we're going to have to get somebody to take them home during the summer or come up here. Well, obviously, you know, they can't take them home, right? So it's like, well, no, you'd have to have somebody come in. And it's hard to get teachers that are on board at some of these schools to take turns taking care of it or whatever. So how do you overcome that obstacle? I'm so glad you asked that question too. I focus on getting in with 4-H clubs, with ag programs, with FFA, um, culinary um, opportunities in different schools, garden clubs, and I don't do the rest. Not that they don't need it, but that's exactly the issue. You don't have buy-in, you don't have somebody to take care of it, and those teachers have enough on their plate already to begin with. Um, and the other thing is you don't need to be the one taking care of that tower. Your time is best spent telling more people about the towers than going in and caring for the tower. So you want the school to adopt the tower. You want them to, to take that in and to make it their own and to have that ownership. Otherwise, it's going to end up in a corner gathering dust or in a closet somewhere. And that's not why we're doing this. We're, we're not doing it to, to just create more clutter and unfortunately end up somewhere where it's not being used. So be strategic about who you approach about it. The, for example, an FFA, an ag program in a, in a high school, they're looking for something called SAEs, which are supervised agricultural experiences, and a tower presents an opportunity for that. And you have children who may live in an apartment or may not have access to you know, farmland, for example, that want to be a part of the FFA for whatever reason, and they need this. They have to have it in order to graduate and to be a part of that program. 
And this is the perfect answer to that. Uh, business schools, that's another one too. We've done, we worked in a high school uh, and they were focused on a DECA program. And so they are adopting a farm, not to grow it, but as a business to be able to take that business model and sell the produce. So that was more of their, their process behind it. Yeah, so just be strategic in who you approach. I, I just, um, for those of you who do have uh, towers and classrooms, I, I do. And the thing that the, the teachers that I work with, um, they only grow during the school year. So if it's right. the school year, we just, uh, they pull the produce and then they start again at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That works too. Absolutely. Because it's so quick to, to, like you were saying, it's so, towers grow so fast, grow the produce so fast that it doesn't take any time to get lettuce up and growing. So they can have it throughout the school year. And then kids can also take home the herbs in the, in the mm -hmm. summer time, put it, plant them in their gardens. So they've got that herb during the summer. Great idea. Thanks, Jake. And thanks, Dr. Nicole. You just gave me some great ideas because FFA is really big here in Texas. And uh, the culinary side of that too, a lot of these high school, uh, school districts have the culinary programs. I know, and I didn't even think about that as a, as a road. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we're working with Irving ISD right outside of Dallas, Fort Worth about that. So if you ever want to connect again, just reach out. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I don't want to keep you. He's got, I know you've probably got patience to, to <laughs> see. So Nicole, thank you so very much. This was so valuable. And um, I hope that I just wish you all the best. Thank you. And what you're doing. Thanks for it's having pretty me. pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible. So thank you. And thank everybody again for your, uh, for being here and your questions. Good stuff.